I think knowledge management has always been relevant. Um, there were challenges in the past. You know, I lived in Zambia for 10 years between 1982 and 1991. I wrote my first project proposal to start um, an HIV prevention initiative in the Copper Belt pro province of Zambia on a manual Olivetti typewriter. And I had um, access to a handful of documents that I received on the post or by chance. So, you know, there was there were clearing houses then and uh, knowledge management had a very important function in those days. It has an even more important function today and a slightly different function given the changing world. Again, I'll give you one concrete example. Last year, we worked with um, uh, the global program on child marriage and with Girls Not Prides, an international partnership to review research priorities on child marriage, preventing child marriage and responding to child brides that we had developed in 2013. And, you know, six years later, we found, you know, a flood of research, a huge increase in research on some issues in some parts of the world. Um, there were clearly gaps, which I won't get into. But, you know, in the past, what we would do is publish guidelines and then update them every few, few years. Now what you see is that um, there's so much learning that is happening and we can't wait for another three years or five years for the next guideline to be published. So increasingly in WHO, we are moving to living guidelines, you know, a process whereby as evidence is generated, as programmatic experiences become available, as data at the national and subnational level are um, uh, synthesized and tabled, um, they're used to relook at our guidelines on a six monthly basis, on an annual basis, so that um, uh, data is kept, guidelines are kept current. And of course, you know, increasingly, as I said earlier, with decentralization, decentralized decision making, we need to do much more than we did in the past about getting guidelines into the hands of, uh, so, you know, key and uh, key informants, a key group of stakeholders at the national level. There are many more players there. There's much more evidence there. And so this really is a crucial part of WHO's work. And I think it needs to be a crucial part of anybody's work uh, in health and in other areas. Originally from India, and I lived in Zambia for 10 years and for a few months in Zimbabwe before joining WHO 25 years ago. And, um, um, you know, I've often felt that the learned experiences from countries uh, are given um, less attention uh, and are paid um, less attention in, in development of guidelines, in informing um, uh, action. And one of the things that COVID-19 has taught us is that the best responses did not come from the richest countries. They did not come from the countries which housed the oldest schools of public health and the most prestigious journals, or even from countries which spend an enormous amount of time, money, and effort in providing technical support to other countries. So for me, uh, one of my life's work for the last 10 years has been uh, documenting and evaluating initiatives which are outside the beaten path and often not looked at or re-looked at. So uh, a competition like this, which um, uh, pays attention to and respects learning from the ground, uh, really excites me. Um, and I think uh, that really is the way to go. The best solutions are not going to be found in textbooks and the old leaders in public health no longer have either the technical expertise or the moral authority anymore to, uh, to provide guidance to the world. I mean, often you are found in, uh, in documents published by many organizations about taking to research, research to action and how important it is to get you know, political buy-in. 